for answers too. Um, before I start that, though, I want to, of course, remind Manitobans that the best way through uh, this pandemic is to get vaccinated. It's the best way to ensure that our businesses stay open, that our houses of worship stay open, that our schools stay open, uh, and that we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. And so uh, continue with that, uh, that encouragement for Manitobans generally. Um, I want to uh, also thank uh, the many Manitobans who've uh, reached out to me and who've engaged uh, with me over the last uh, little more than two weeks now. Uh, dozens and dozens of meetings had the opportunity to attend the uh, Peace Garden near Bois of Vane for the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks and a great opportunity just to again not only remember uh, that tragic day but to talk about the need uh, for peace generally uh, going forward in the world and was pleased to uh, be joined by Canadian American officials uh, at that very unique place in Manitoba and North Dakota. Uh, had a good meeting with the Grand Chiefs uh, recently Good discussions, open dialogue, um, clear and frank discussion, as those discussions should be, uh, and I appreciated their their comments uh, as well and their candor. And of course, uh, I was honored to be able to in invest into the Order of the Buffalo Hunt, the 2019 uh, Grey Cup champion Winnipeg uh, Blue Bombers, uh, which I know is personally important to many Manitobans, including uh, my family, in, in a time where there's a lot of challenge and difficulty, it's also good to be able to celebrate uh, the things that we like to celebrate uh, in more normal times. And I appreciate uh, Wade Miller and Dana Spiring for being able to arrange that. So uh, as I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, there were some questions regarding things that I wasn't able to give details on. I wanted to update you on, on those things and report back to the media as I promised that I would on some things. Regarding the House, um, good discussions over the last uh, couple of weeks with the NDP House Leader Nahani Fontaine and the Liberal House Leader Dr. John Gerard. So uh, I believe that we've settled on returning on October 6th to the legislature, which would have been the normal start date for the Assembly to, to come back. Uh, because we are not proceeding with the five designated bills, we spoke about that uh, last time. There was discussions about the mechanism by which they wouldn't proceed uh, in the House, so they'll be uh, withdrawn on the first day of sitting on that October 6. Uh, it requires unanimous consent. I'm expecting we'll get unanimous consent for the withdrawal of those bills as well on that day. BITSA, the Budget Implementation and Tax Statute Amendment Act, will be uh, tabled. Uh, looking and hoping to pass Bill 72, which is the Disability Support Act, which is brought forward by the Minister of Families, our Deputy Premier, Michelle Squires. Uh, so looking for support from the opposition to pass that. I know it's important to many within the um, community. The session will uh, last uh, two weeks, so uh, the balance of that week and the balance of the next week, there'll be some later sitting uh, dates and probably some late nights. Um, there isn't a heavy legislative agenda, obviously, because the five bills that were the primary agenda are being withdrawn. Um, but uh, there is still quite a bit of budgetary process to go through. So the estimates process that detailed, as you know, as uh, reporters in the legislature, that line by line questioning of the budget, that'll um, continue on. I think we have about 56 or 57 hours left of that. So we expect to be able to get through that uh, with some later sitting days and uh, probably a couple of later nights. So I appreciate, again, uh, being able to work with the opposition House leaders. Uh, I am still the government House leader, so despite uh, taking on the role of uh, Premier, of course, there are some of us who are doing double, uh, double duty because of just the nature of uh, what's happening with the leadership. Uh, campaign and so uh, continue on as government house leader uh, in, the, in that role. So I appreciate working with the other house leaders and the speaker on this. There were questions last uh, time that I was in this setting. I've had other media availability since then, but in, in this uh, room about the Council of the uh, Federation and the meeting of the premiers, which is scheduled to take place. I think it was October 5th to the 7th. Um, so that was to be an in-person meeting uh, held here in Manitoba. Uh, these are really important uh, tables to be at. I was the chair of the health minister's uh, table in 2018 
Um, and so I, I know how important these tables are for those who aren't as familiar with it. Council of the Federation is just simply all the premiers uh, who work together on a number of initiatives that are national in scope. Um, ministers typically have their own sort of national table, so the health ministers would meet regularly as an example, and the ministers of families across, uh, across the country, and there's usually a chair. Uh, it, it alternates between provinces, and so um, it, it goes between the, the different provinces in terms of who is the chair that year. So Manitoba's turn to be the chair of the Council of Federations um, was this year, and so we were going to hold that in-person meeting, and I think the hope was that we could. But given uh, what's happening uh, in many places in Canada, in the general state of the pandemic, there will not be an in-person meeting of COF of the Council of Federations here in Manitoba, as was planned. Uh, and further to that, I mean, I, I know how important it is to have, you know, consistency and stability at those tables, having done the health table for, for a year. And it's not really fair, I think, for the Council of Federations to have uh, three chairs in uh, about four months. So as much as, as uh, I very much would have liked to have chaired the meeting, we'll participate uh, in, uh, in the meeting, I think, next week uh, that will happen virtually after the federal uh, election. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not good for the, the, the cough generally to have uh, that kind of active changing of the chairs, and there would be another, of course, change after our leadership convention at the end of October. So I spoke with Premier Horgan yesterday in, in uh, British Columbia and asked if he would be agreeable for uh, BC to become the chair of COF for this year and for Manitoba then to resume chair uh, next year. And uh, we had a very good conversation and he, he uh, thought it was a good uh, idea and agreed to, to do it. And so that will be formally announced, I think, by COF uh, very shortly through, uh, through a news uh, release. So I appreciate Premier Horgan uh, making a way for that. I think it would be good for COF to have that, um, that consistency. I'll be the vice uh, chair, Manitoba will be the vice chair for the remainder of the year. So I look forward to joining uh, other premiers on uh, on those virtual calls in the time that I'm in uh, this position. And I also look forward to the new premier being able to then host uh, COF uh, in our iteration uh, when we uh, take over uh, later next year. There were also questions. I think the question came from Steve, although I know Steve's uh, not here because he's off to a, an important uh, event, but uh, regarding the PUB and uh, the hydro rate application. So because all five bills are being uh, withdrawn on that first day of session, that also includes Bill 35, which is the um, bill regarding public uh, utilities uh, and rate applications and rate setting, which is supposed to smooth it out over a five-year process, but there was an interim rate uh, contained within that bill. There were discussions, I think, uh, and questions from the media about whether or not uh, a rate would be set in BITSA in the, uh, in the session. Uh, that won't be the case. Uh, Hydro uh, has been asked to do an interim rate application, uh, and so they will go through the normal um, PUB process, and then there will likely be a general rate application uh, next year, probably on a three-year uh, window for the setting of, of the Hydro rate. So there won't be a Hydro rate included in the budget implementation uh, act that you'll see uh, at the beginning of session, and uh, Minister uh, Jeff Wharton will have uh, more to say about that and more details in the days ahead. And finally, uh, we talked a little bit about land acknowledgement in the legislature. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the last availability here in this room, I think it's it's time has come, and um, it's important to to have that in the Manitoba legislature, but it's also important to get it right. Uh, and I also think that consultation is important. I know I've, I uh, will disagree with my uh, uh, friend, uh, the House Leader from the NDP uh, on this one. I think uh, consultation is the respectful way to do it. I also know that things that happen in the legislature tend to last for about 100 years, so I think it's important to get it right. Um, so I've asked um, three MLAs uh, to engage in that consultation and report back to me uh, by uh, October 22nd. Uh, Eileen Clark will uh, be the lead uh, in terms of um, that consultation for our caucus, joined with uh, Greg Nesbitt, who is the 
uh, caucus chair and uh, Andrew Smith, uh, our, uh, our MLA. So um, expected those consultations to go well. We need to get the wording right. Um, had a good discussion this morning with Brian Bowman about, um, Mayor Brian Bowman, about a number of things. Uh, this was one of those. I know the City of Winnipeg has done land acknowledgement in City Council for a long time. So, you know, he has some advice and I think is willing to lend some of, of the work that they've done on that. So we'll be consulting with, of course, uh, Indigenous leadership, um, but also um, the City and taking up on some of their experience uh, as well. So look forward to the conclusion of those uh, consultations and uh, then bringing it to the Rules Committee of the Legislature uh, together with the NDP and the Liberals uh, shortly after October uh, 22nd. So I expect that by um, the next session of the legislature, this should be formalized uh, in the rules. Also, um, I think there's an opportunity with these consultations to use the text um, once the consultations are concluded in annual reports of government. So to have an acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement in the annual reports of government uh, I think is also important and it would coincide well with these consultations. So those are the things that I promised um, the uh, esteemed media in this room that I would report back on and i um, happy to take other questions that you have. Okay, when, it, when it comes to Manitoba's COVID-19 response, who do you support, the province's top doctor or a fellow party member, Ken Lee, who's criticized you, bashed Dr. Rusin, similar to the way some Republicans have bashed Dr. Fauci in the U.S. I mean, who's, who do you support, Rusin or Ken Lee? So you know, uh, um, Carol, that I'm not getting involved in, in the leadership race, and so there will be candidates who will make uh, statements about a variety of, of different things, not limited to that. Um, and as the Premier, I'm clearly not getting involved in the race, and as the leader of the party, uh, I'm not involved in the race. There's this, you know, separate committee that makes sure the rules are followed and those sort of things. Um, but I've said all along that, um, you know, we are working uh, together with public health to manage this uh, pandemic. Um, there's uh, always different questions that come up when it comes to uh, to public health, but uh, when it comes to Dr. Rusin's and others, uh, we have good discussions and uh, we come out together uh, unified on how we should be dealing with uh, the pandemic. And so I uh, appreciate the work of, of Dr. Rusin and uh, continue to support him. You don't think he's failed Manitobans? No. President Alberta, with all the issues that they're having with uh, COVID and this fourth wave and the healthcare system, have they reached out to you? Has Premier Kenny reached out to you seeking help uh, to reciprocate some of the ICU patients that we sent their way in the third wave? where we might potentially have some come this way, or have they reached out looking for other supplies or support? There, there's not been a, a reach out from, uh, from Premier Kennedy uh, or uh, Premier Mo directly. Um, but I know that health officials, you know, through the pandemic are always talking to uh, each other at, at that level, uh, as they should, not just about, you know, ICU capacity, but a, but a variety of other things as they're learning. So. Um, you know, I, I don't doubt that there are discussions that happen at the officials' levels about a variety of different scenarios as, as they've been happening for 18, uh, 18 months. But there's not been a direct uh, uh, reach out. But of course, you know, we benefited um, by support from Saskatchewan and Alberta and particularly Ontario uh, during the, the uh, third wave. And, uh, you know, if we had the uh, ability to uh, to offer support, I think uh, that we'd want to, like we do in in, uh, in lots of different things. I mean, sometimes we get support for forest fires, and sometimes we offer support for forest fires. So regardless of, of what the situation uh, is, whether it's health or other things, if we can support other provinces, if we have that capacity, uh, then we would. But those would be uh, health decisions based on what they're seeing uh, within the healthcare system. When, when you consider what's happening in those other provinces, um, I mean, how do you reflect on Manitoba's situation? Do you support what we've done so far? So, you know, I've learned, um, as you know, Ian, that things change quickly. And, uh, and so I think we are in a good place right now compared to uh, other provinces. But I also know that things can change day to day and that we need to be mindful of that and continually 
looking at how do we ensure that you know we are still remaining in in a good place. Um, I look at what some of the other provinces are now doing in response to the uh, into the fourth wave, and those are a lot of things that we did weeks ago. Uh, so in many ways, I, I think that we've been uh, proactive in this uh, in this particular time. Um, and uh, hopefully that allows us to have a bit of a steady state for a while. I know one of the frustrations that people, you know, rightfully have uh, is that the, the orders change a lot. Um, and that's not a criticism, that's responding to things as, as they happen, but it does cause frustration. It causes people to not always understand what the, what the orders are. Um, I think by being proactive uh, on, on the things that we've done, in the last uh, few weeks has probably allowed us uh, to be in a little bit more of a steady state, but every day is a new day in this, uh, in this time, in this pandemic, and so it would be foolhardy to make predictions, um, but um, I think at this moment, as we talk today, uh, compared to other uh, provinces, we're in a pretty good place. Premier, how would you feel about being replaced by somebody who, who promises to undo a lot of the pandemic response, a lot of the restrictions, a lot of the, the efforts that your government has made to keep Manitoba safe. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, going to comment on the details of, of the leadership race or individual platforms that um, the candidates will have. Uh, I will be replaced, uh, Carol. Every time I come here, somebody asks uh, when I'm going to be replaced, I'll be replaced on October 30th, and that'll be done by the um, uh, by the vote of, of membership. Um, I've signed up to do this in a relatively short period of time or for a relatively short period of time uh, and um, and the party will decide who its next leader is and by virtue of that the um, the next premier. So uh, I'm committed to doing the best job that that I can and make the best decisions that I believe I can make for all Manitobans in the time that I'm uh, I'm the premier and uh, the next leader, I would hope, will do the same. You are, though, the in interim party leader, and there are thousands of members that are adamantly against, really, the major decisions your government has made. What do you say to those thousands of members? Well, there's, there's lots of divide in society these days, and I think I said last time that's, that's one of my you know, disappointments and regrets, is that there is, there is so much uh, divide. In some ways, I guess it's somewhat unavoidable because there are difficult choices that are, that are being made, and clearly people have very different views, and they're not always going to be able to bridge those views. What I ask people to do is to be respectful uh, to one another and to each other. Um, but while I'm uh, in this chair as Premier, uh, I recognize that there are decisions that, that I'll have to make and that our government will have to make that not everybody is going to agree on, um, but they are going to be decisions that are based on the evidence that we have before us and that are in the best interest of all Manitobans now and going forward. Uh, the next leader of the party, I hope, would you know look through that same lens and, and do the same thing for Manitobans. These are not easy decisions. There are no magic solutions. Uh, sometimes you are just choosing between bad choices in a uh, in a pandemic uh, and, and I recognize that and I knew that coming into this job even for a short period of time but um, that is sometimes what has to happen uh, in we're at this moment uh, in a good place but I don't doubt that there might be difficult choices to come yet what kind of executive powers would uh, somebody have if they won the leadership and became the premier and they weren't a member of the legislative assembly well, uh, that's a good uh, question, Tom, and I don't pretend to be, you know, a parliamentary scholar. Um, well, you might be the closest we have, actually, so I might defer to you. Um, but, you know, my read of it is that if somebody is uh, elected the leader of a party uh, that has the majority of a house, I mean, they become the premier, but they're not able, unless they have a seat, to enter the house. So, you know, there would have to be, you know, somebody in the house who would you know, take the uh, take the questions. But that presumes the outcome of the race, and I'm not presuming the outcome of the race. So um, we'll, uh, we'll let the party members make those those decisions, and uh, and then we'll go forward on uh, October 30th. But hypothetically, what executive powers would they have? Would they have all the same executive powers that any other premier has? I mean, you have executive powers right now, whether you're in the House or not. You can pass orders in council. You can make certain appointments. The executive powers of, of a first minister are substantial. 
uh, would, would the, whoever wins this leadership, if they hypothetically were not an MLA, would they have those same executive powers on it? Yeah. So it, automatically? Yeah, I don't know if uh, Professor Cooper, Professor Thomas would be a better person to ask of that. My read of it is that a person who is elected to premier is elected premier. So. Would your caucus support uh, a leader that is adamantly anti-vax? Uh, that is well down the uh, hypothetical rabbit hole, uh, and I appreciate you want me to go down that uh, hole, but uh, I've made the determination to stay out of the leadership race, and so. I'll, I will stay out of the, the leadership race and won't make uh, speculative comments about what the party will, will decide, um, other than to say, you know, during my time here as, as Premier, I'll make the decisions that I think are together with uh, my cabinet colleagues and caucus colleagues that are in the best interests of Manitobans uh, in the long term, and that's the scope that I look through it. I'm not looking through it in the scope of um, what party members might feel or or what uh, you know, different factions of, of Manitoba might feel. I I live those challenges and those difficulties, and I understand those, um, and I understand the division. I understand the divide. I don't I don't like it, but that doesn't influence the decision making. I have to make the decisions based on the best information that we're provided, looking at what's happening uh, in Manitoba and in other places, and doing the best that that I can and that our cabinet can. Uh, in this time, irrespective of what's happening in the party, uh, but what's in the best interest of Manitobans overall. Can you talk about the decision to just withdraw the five bills as opposed to proroguing or other mechanisms that could have been used? Yeah. Uh, why that one? And to carry on with uh, Bill 72 as opposed to just wiping the entire slate clean and starting over after passing bits of People are going to be turning off the channel if I get too deep into you know, like legislative procedure, right? I mean, why this might interest me, I don't think it interests you know, many people beyond this room. Uh, well, there was a couple of things, as you mentioned, we, we could have done, right? I mean, we need unanimous consent to withdraw the bills just by virtue of the rules. So, you know, I didn't expect that that would be a concern or problem with the opposition, but I never presumed these things either. So wanted to, you know, go through that negotiation um, process and to, to ensure that we had some sort of clear path and what this legislative session would look like and not get the budgetary stuff hung up because, you know, that's important for programs and for people uh, within the public service who need to get uh, paid. So. Um, it was really a negotiation. Uh, it was always a preference, I think, to do a, uh, withdraw the bills and find a clear path in terms of what this legislative session uh, would look like, both for the benefit of government and the benefit of opposition. I mean, there were mechanisms by which we could have not had a debate or not completed the 56 hours of estimates. I don't think that would have been good. I think it's important for opposition to be able to ask questions of me and others in, uh, in the Executive Council and Cabinet. And so it was a negotiation to make sure that uh, we could properly withdraw the bills, but also that opposition could ask questions in a time when they should be able to ask questions. I was in opposition a long time, and I see the importance of that. So again, I want to thank the NDP and Liberal House leaders. Was land acknowledgments part of that negotiation? And then obviously that's something that uh, the Honey Family no, has been pushing. Not part of the negotiation, something uh, our party uh, thinks the time has come. We want to get it right, so we'll engage in consultations. I understand the other two parties are supportive of it as well, so you know we'll certainly engage them uh, as we get uh, into that process of the Rules Committee in, in the House, but I think it's now not a matter of if it happens, but uh, how it happens, so we just want to make sure that it gets done right. Does your government have any new ideas or new strategies on how to combat the misinformation uh, out there with regard to um, you know, anti-vaccination or even just vaccine hesitancy? Um, seems to be really the, the, the thing that's holding back um, the province from getting past the pandemic is getting past this misinformation. And I know it's a difficult uh, situation, but are there, any, are there any new solutions, any new strategies that government um, is talking about to, to be able to combat that misinformation? Because it really seems to be the root of all our problems right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's the root of all of our problems, but it certainly is part of our problems, yeah. Yeah, I, I get it, Tom, and, and, I, and I get the question, and I get where you're coming from on it. Um, I wish there was an easy answer to it. Uh, as you know, information spreads and misinformation spreads these days in a way that, you know, we couldn't have imagined uh, 20 years ago. Um, so government's always engaged. We talked a little bit even with Dr. Reimer yesterday about, you know, how can we be more um, out front and more clear uh, in terms of you know um, the efficacy and the safety 
of, of vaccines and, and trying to dispel misinformation as it, as it comes up. I know that they're, the vaccine task force is doing their best at trying to get that out as quickly as possible. So we talked a little bit about how we can be more responsive more quickly, but it's not a challenge I think uh, that we're going to easily solve because of the nature of, of uh, how information is spread these days on social media, but not just social media. Um, but all of us have a role in it. But I, I, I don't pretend, Tom, that there's an easy answer to it or a magic solution. Thank you, Mr. Premier. We will go to the phone now. A reminder to our reporters on the line, you will have one preliminary and one follow-up question. Up first this morning from CTV Winnipeg, Jeff. Well, hi, Mr. Premier. Uh, could I just get a clarification on the hydro rate? Uh, there's going to be an interim application, and will that set the rate you said for the next three years, or will there be an interim one and then another one next year? I'm just, if I could just get a clarification on that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jeff. And uh, well, I will leave the details to, to Minister Wharton, as he's the um, minister responsible and by therefore the expert of it within our within our cabinet. Um, it'll be an interim rate application that'll set the uh, rate, I think, for for this current uh, year, and then a general rate application would take place next year, uh, I believe, for the uh, following three years. So there is this interim period between now and next year, and then a GRA or general rate application that would happen through Hydro and the PUB um, that would take place next year for the following three years. That's my understanding of it. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and, and the fact that there's going to be a general rate application for three years, um, I mean, is that a signal that there's no desire to bring back another version of the bill that will be withdrawn? Or I guess a new premier could do whatever a new premier wants. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really speak for everything that a new premier uh, will do. I think the, the desire of our uh, caucus and cabinet at this point is to, you know, be able to uh, bring some certainty in terms of rates. Um, that is actually what the intention of of the bill was, is to provide you know broader certainty. I know there was questions about how that certainty happened in the PUB process. So maybe this uh, you know helps to achieve both to ensure that the PUB process is engaged, but then also there's a longer term perspective because it's important for people to have sort of rate certainty. Um, going forward. So again, can't speak for everything a new Premier will or won't do, but uh, I think it's the desire of Cox and Cabinet to to see both the, the process happen through the PUB and to have some rate certainty for Manitobans going forward. From the Brandon Sun, Kyle. Uh, good morning, Premier. Um, is Manitoba prepared for the fourth wave with regards to pediatric hospitalization, specifically ICU beds, uh, especially with the return of school uh, last week? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I did have some discussions um, along with our uh, cabinet with public health uh, yesterday in terms of the fourth wave. Um, my understanding is that in terms of pediatric beds, there is an ability to um, fairly significantly increase the number of, uh, of ICU pediatric beds. So that work has been happening uh, together with our Minister of Health, uh, Audrey Gordon, I think previous to that as well. So there's there's been work on that and they do have the ability to increase the um, pediatric bed uh, ICU capacity. But, you know, the details in terms of the, the number, uh, I'll leave uh, to them, but, um, but it's, it was significant. So there's been good work on that and hopefully we don't need to to use it, but obviously, you know, the preparations is important, recognizing that their healthcare system is, is you know, under stress and they're strained. And so um, it's not going to be uh, easy or um, maybe as high as anybody uh, would want in situations, but, but the work has certainly uh, happened and there has been results from that. Okay, thank you. And uh, how did the meeting with the Manitoba government and general employees union president go a couple of weeks ago uh, when you guys were discussing healthcare support staff? Voting for uh, for a strike. Are you talking about the meeting with Michelle uh, Gronsky? Yes. Uh, well, Michelle and I, you know, we've have long uh, uh, relationship. I, uh, we she doesn't live that far from where I live, and so we've talked uh, a lot in, in uh, when I was health minister and and different sorts of things. It was it was a good meeting. I mean, don't get me wrong, we didn't solve every 
difference or outstanding dispute that exists within uh, within government and with MGU. Um, but I think there's a willingness to continue discussions. I recognize the challenges that her members are under, and she's, you know, representing her members and her membership in, in the best way that she can. Um, but uh, you know, I appreciate the work that she does and that she has to advocate uh, for her members and she did a good job of advocating and we listened and certainly brought some of those concerns back to health and we'll continue to try to work with them. From CJOB, Skyler. Hi, Premier. Uh, AMC Grand Chief Arlen Dumas uh, had some pretty strong words against uh, Manitoba Hydro earlier this week. He said uh, Hydro is treating First Nations as second-class communities. Uh, I know that was one of your first calls as soon as you got in office. I'm just wondering if you think Hydro is doing enough to restore power to uh, Little Grand Rapids and Pangasi First Nations right now. Yeah, thanks for the question. And, uh, you know, I've had some good discussions with uh, Grand Chief Dumas and have appreciated, you know, the concerns that he's raised, not just on this file, but on other files. And I hope that we'll be able to take some action on it. Specific to this file, I, I understand that there are, going off of memory, but I think 88 uh, power lines that need to be repaired. I think as of this morning, they had repaired about 50. Uh, so I know that they're working, you know, as, as hard as they can. I know that Grand Chief Dumas was talking about um, potential interim power supplies. Uh, I have raised that with uh, hydro officials. Um, I think that, uh, you know, their analysis w would be that it might be uh, as long to get the interim power supplies, it might be to get the uh, the remaining power lines fixed. Um, so I know they're working, you know, as hard as they can and as quickly as possible. I do believe that they see it as a priority, uh, and they're doing the best that they can in pretty difficult circumstances. And I appreciate uh, Grand Chief Dumas raising it, though, and, and I've raised it with hydro officials as well. And and uh, I know they're going to continue to make this a priority. Thank you. When it comes to uh, enforcement on uh, public health orders, mask mandates and vaccine mandates in some industries, uh, you know, it seems the third, fourth time around, people are getting pretty dug in. Is there a change in strategy coming for businesses that are, you know, they know what they have to do, but they're just choosing not to do it on their own? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the enforcement side of things has been a challenge for, for 18 months, uh, not just on non-compliance, but in terms of who who can do the enforcement and of course the the rules have changed a lot over 18 18 months and so that has sometimes become a challenge so you know we continue to work with uh, the enforcement officials and with the department of justice and the minister of justice about you know are there ways it's not just about you know enforcement it's also about education so you know how much of it is that there isn't an awareness of should be done and how much of it is that some people just don't want to uh, follow the public health uh, orders and so it's a bit of a balance um, but uh, you know we've made commitments to enforcement and those commitments remain uh, so we continue to work with the justice officials to see where there are our challenges and sort of what the root of those challenges are it's not it's not always just as simple as um, that some businesses or individuals are refusing to um, to follow it sometimes there's other sort of education matters that have to happen from CBC Radio Canada Charles. Good morning, Premier. Uh, question I have for you. Um, when will the list of the candidates into the race to become the party's next leader and mentor as Premier will be published? That's a determination of, uh, of the party. I think that there is a, a subcommittee that struck for the, uh, for the leadership process that does the vetting of the candidates to ensure that they're following the different rules that have been set out. So I know the deadline was yesterday, and I imagine that they're going through the process that they need to finish going through. And uh, I don't think it would be long, but I'm not on the committee, and I'm not instructing them to, uh, uh, to produce anything in any particular time. Thank you, Premier. Premier. And I know you said you would like to stay neutral, but some candidates into the race for Premier said they were against vaccine requirements. So as the actual Prime Minister, what is your position on that matter? Well, I appreciate you electing me Prime Minister. I'm not, uh, I'm not the Prime Minister. I have no desire to be Prime Minister, although I didn't want this job either, and then who knows? Uh, no, I, um, I appreciate the, the question. As, as the Premier, um, my position is that it is important for people uh, to get vaccinated. It's the best way for us to get through this pandemic. It's the best way to keep our businesses 
our places of worship, our schools open and not overwhelm the healthcare system. So uh, while I'm in this chair, I will continue to encourage people uh, to become vaccinated, those who are not vaccinated, uh, and we'll continue to work with public health uh, in the best that we can to ensure that whatever is coming in terms of a fourth wave is blunted and that we don't end up in a situation um, where we're not able to provide the health care uh, that people would expect uh, or that thousands of surgeries um, again get cancelled. Those are very real concerns. I know sometimes that, well, not sometimes, I know that, it's, that, that those decisions are sometimes uh, divisive for people and it results in division. Um, but when I took this job and I swore the oath of office, even for a short period of time, it was to ensure that the best decisions got made for all Manitobans, uh, even if not everyone agrees, and that's what's the guiding principle for, uh, for us uh, now, and uh, hopefully those will be the guiding principles for the new leader, whoever uh, he or she may be. From CBC National News, Cameron. Hi, Premier. Just on the notion of uh, potentially helping other provinces on COVID in the fourth wave, um, looking at our numbers right now and looking at what's happening here, how might Manitoba be best positioned to do that? Would it be sending staff out, bringing patients in, sending out equipment? Just kind of curious uh, where we're best positioned and what you may actually feel most comfortable with. Yeah, thanks, Cameron. So, I mean, it's not a decision that, that I as Premier would make. I mean, those would be health care decisions based on what the health officials feel they're able to provide and what other provinces may or may not need at, at any given time. So, yeah, you'll remember that during the third wave, you know, we got assistance when it came to some nursing uh, staff. And, of course, we were able to access ICU beds in other provinces. That's what we needed uh, at the time, we weren't in need of, you know, ventilators or, or PPE, I don't believe. That wasn't our our um, limiting factor. And so, you know, depending on what other provinces may need, if they if they actually put in a request, I mean, we would then look at that uh, with our health officials to see if, uh, if that could be accommodated at the time. So we're grateful for the fact that, that other provinces, um, you know, helped us during the third wave. We've helped other provinces um, for different things at different times. And so, you know, if there was an opportunity and health officials felt they were able to, to do so, and if a request actually came in, uh, you know, that's not something, that's something we would consider, obviously, at the time. And lastly, on the fourth wave here, looking at what's happened in Saskatchewan, looking at what's happened in Alberta, albeit there have been different restrictions through the summer in those two provinces compared to ours, how concerning is, are those situations uh, looking at what's basically happening next door to us? Yeah, I mean, it's always concerning, right? And, and I think that we, we know that we're not uh, immune to, to any of this um, and that the challenges that exist in Saskatchewan and Alberta uh, could exist in Manitoba again. I think that's one of the reasons that we took, you know, proactive measures um, a few weeks ago. We've had the mandatory indoor uh, mask mandate for public places for um, for a while now. Uh, we implemented it in schools at the beginning of the school year, not without some degree of controversy, of course, and that's true for every decision these days. Um, we uh, we brought in the required testing provision for certain uh, for certain sectors. If individuals aren't getting uh, vaccinated, I think we'll have more to say about that next week. Uh, again, all of these things had some degree of controversy around them, um, but now we see that other provinces who are well into their fourth wave are doing the things that Manitoba did uh, well before we uh, got into a fourth wave scenario. So hopefully that helps to blunt some of that effect and allows us to uh, keep those businesses open, those houses of worship, schools, uh, and not overwhelm our healthcare system. There's no perfect answer, I don't think, to any of these things, but I think that that proactive uh, measure puts us in the best place possible. Thanks. We now return to the News Conference Theater. On Indigenous land acknowledgements, uh, why is your Indigenous Reconciliation Minister not on the working group? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, I guess the three MLAs that are on the committee are all white. It's, um, it's of course, you know that, uh, you know, Eileen Clark, uh, who is the chair of the committee, has a great deal of respect from um, those who are in the Indigenous community for her work when she was the minister. Uh, so I think that she's an excellent person to 
uh, to lead that uh, work, and I don't think that you'd find anybody uh, within the community who would largely disagree with that. Um, the reason that they're members of the caucus, uh, and it's a good question, uh, Ian, is because it's, it's a little bit separate from ex executive council. So the rules of the assembly um, are really rules that govern MLAs generally and not executive council in particular. So the assembly is different than cabinet per se. Um, you know, um, as premier, I'm, I'm, you know, the premier for the province, but I'm not necessarily, you know, the premier for the assembly itself. It has its own governing set of rules and it doesn't function the same way a cabinet would function. So I thought it was important to have three uh, members who are not a part of executive council, but who are members of the assembly lead that because ultimately that recommendation will come back to me as house leader. Again, I'm wearing a few hats right now. Uh, and then it'll go to the Rules Committee of the House, not of Cabinet or Executive Council. It would ultimately be a Rules Committee of the Manitoba Assembly that'll, um, that'll make that final decision. So that's why they're not members of Executive Council. Why don't we get an all-party committee? Well, I think the other two parties have already indicated that they are uh, supportive, uh, that they have their own um, ideas of what the land acknowledgement should be. So because they've already sort of come to that uh, conclusion of what things should look like, we thought we would go through a consultation process first externally. I think we will then bring in Tom, um, the Liberals and the NDP, and because we have to, uh, and because we want to, but it has to go to the Rules Committee. So ultimately it becomes an all-party decision, um, but I think to some extent they've gone through their own process already individually, and so we'll go through our process and then we'll collectively meet. And I don't think there's going to be a lot of differences. I mean, I think the wording is important, so there might be some, some questions around that, uh, but that will collectively go together then uh, through the Rules Committee. Do you envision it as being a daily acknowledgement uh, that, gets, um, that, that gets set at the same time as the prayer once a day? You know, that, that would be, you know, um, if, if I were giving uh, feelings on it, that would make the most sense to me. But again, I don't want to jump ahead of consultations. Uh, there's a reasons why we're doing it, because others might have different views. There might be different reasons why it should be not done in different parts of, of the day. Um, you know, during my time in the legislature, that would seem like a natural fit, but, you know, let the consultations work itself out. Do you out. think it's important to do it? You know, it's imp it probably should have been done uh, a while ago. I think it's, it's important to recognize that um, not only is the legislature on land that was uh, first inhabited by our, uh, our Indigenous people, um, but I think that daily reminder about the importance of reconciliation. I know it's not specific to reconciliation. It doesn't speak specifically to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but there is something about a daily reminder, and if it happens at the beginning of the day and before question period, and you know what question period is like, um, I think that that is, is something that will benefit all MLAs. And, you know, my hope is that it doesn't become something that just sort of becomes, you know, routine and it just happens and people don't think about it to the extent that, you know, uh, everybody um, is reminded about the importance of, uh, of the fact that we are uh, all treaty people and that we are on uh, land inhabited by the Indigenous people first. I think that that's a good daily reminder. Why didn't it happen before this? Was there opposition within the caucus or is it just a matter of doing the work and that work never got done? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of different things that, that happen in government and I'm not making excuses, um, you know, and to the extent that, that people want to say, well, it's my responsibility because I was the house leader, they can say it's my responsibility. Um, but I think that there's a time for, for, for things. This probably should have been done uh, sooner. Sometimes, you know, there are events that happen that uh, help clarify uh, things for individuals and that you have experiences that uh, help to crystallize the need for, for certain things. That might be true in its individuals. That might be true collectively for us as a society. Um, this isn't specific to it, but I, but I, I know when the, um, uh, the unmarked graves were found in British Columbia and had the opportunity to come in and meet with residential school survivors and, and lower the flags at that time. Uh, you know, it was a moving experience for myself and for my family and we, we learned a lot that day and we've learned a lot since. Um, so I, I'm glad that it's happening now. I'm glad I can be a part of it and, you know, to the extent that it should, uh, should have happened sooner, 
I don't disagree with that, but I'm glad that uh, I think we're moving in the right direction now. City News visited Southern Manitoba yesterday and talked to several individuals who expressed that they weren't vaccinated, and the reason they weren't was they felt like it was being forced on them. I appreciate your response earlier was we need to increase education, but that sounds like an emotional resistance. Is there alternatives beyond education that we can use for this portion of the province that is still the lowest vaccinated group? You know, it's a good point, though, and, and, and when, when people and it's it's why I've tried to use you know language that isn't um, isn't forceful. Um, there are some people who feel that that the vaccine is being forced upon them, and so you know um, sometimes people talk about you know uh, forced vaccination or vaccine mandates. Well, that's not what we have in Manitoba. We have a required testing provision if you're not vaccinated. So I think language sometimes matters when we're speaking about these things. I think your approach sometimes matters. Uh, mentioned this last time, but I don't know of anybody who's changed their mind in an argument on, on Facebook. Um, where I've seen uh, people make a decision to, to become vaccinated when they weren't going to be vaccinated, it is because, particularly in recent, in recent days, um, because you're having those individual conversations or there's somebody they trust in the community or in their circle of friends or in their business. Um, that's ultimately, I think, where we're probably moving, moving the dial uh, on, uh, on vaccination now at this rate. And so that work has to continue. But uh, sometimes language matters and sometimes tone matters. Um, and, uh, and I don't want people to think that it is a forced choice. I want people to know it's the right choice. Uh, and so how we message that it's the right choice and not a forced choice isn't easy, but it's important. You've talked about that need for respect and calm between whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. We're hearing more and more conflicts and issues coming out of Southern Manitoba, specifically Winkler. Uh, how concerning is that for you? And are you hearing these, uh, these points where people are getting into conflict and it's going beyond just an argument or a discussion? I hear about conflict. I don't hear it about it just in one area of the province. I think that, you know, there there are people with very strong views throughout the province uh, on this, and I do worry about conflict. I, I, you know, it's one thing to to disagree with with another person. Um, it's another thing to enter into some sort of, you know, conflictual um, engagement with them. And I made that point when it came to the protests, right? When there were discussions about protesting in front of, of the hospital, uh, it's not appropriate. It's not the place for, um, for that kind of demonstration. You can intimidate people going into a hospital. You can um, uh, prevent people from maybe getting treatment that, that they need. Uh, and it doesn't quite make sense because the people in the hospitals aren't uh, making these decisions. And so if you want to have a peaceful protest at the legislature, that is absolutely within your right as a Canadian. If you want to have a peaceful protest at uh, at City Hall on some issue, you can you can do that as well. I mean, we're elected officials, and and that's part of what um, uh, comes with being an elected official. Um, but you know, I would implore people that um, I know it feels like this is going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. But the actions that we take and the things that we do. Um, some of those memories are going to last forever for people and to the best that we all can we can be um, we can disagree we don't have to be disagreeable on things and i would i would ask people to remember that you know the de decisions and discussions that are happening with public health officials are all with one goal and that is to keep things open this fall so that houses of worship can stay open and businesses and schools uh, and hospitals don't become overwhelmed. Those are the goals. So you may not agree with the mechanism by which those goals are being met, but those are the goals, and hopefully everybody can at least agree on that. And just remember, this won't go on forever, but the actions that we take and the things that we do, those memories might last forever. And, um, and, and I don't want to see that. The optic, I think, is that church leaders hold a lot of power in southern Manitoba. Has the government reached out to church leaders to try and empower them to speak to their congregations with compassion or address this issue from maybe what I'll call the grassroots of that region? Yeah, you know what, I, I've had a lot of discussions, both in my role as, as an MLA and as a minister and, and then a little bit more recently as the Premier with discussions of leaders in the faith community. Overwhelmingly, I find them to be um, respectful, that they're engaging with their 
their um, congregations or their different uh, places of worship. I think they're engaging with them respectfully. I think they're encouraging them to be uh, respectful. That has overall been my uh, my experience. I believe that you know 95% of faith-based leaders, uh, while they may not agree with everybody, are are asking their uh, those in their congregation to act uh, in a way that is reflective of the faith that they are practicing. Um, I know that there are some that sometimes get attention that might not be uh, in the same way, but I do think that 95%, if not more, of those faith leaders are engaging with their uh, those in their congregations um, to say, you know, reflect the faith that uh, that you're practicing and representing. So you said that some people just don't want to follow the public health orders. Um, in those cases, should the public health orders be enforced consistently in all jurisdictions of the province? Because we're hearing that there's a lot of times where they're not being followed and they're not being enforced in some parts of the province. Well, I mean, you know, the province has taken pretty significant efforts, Carol, on enforcement over, over 18 months. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we're not going to be able to have enforcement officers everywhere at every time. So. I think they're trying to do their best where they where they see there are challenges, whether that's in certain industries, for example, or certain sectors, to do their best on uh, on enforcement. But I, I can't pretend that in every place where there is somebody who's not following a public health order, that there's going to be there somebody there to enforce it. But I, I do think that the province, has, as much as any province, done their best to find ways to uh, to enforce it. But we're 18 months into this, and uh, it is getting more than 18 months, and it's, it's tiring for people, and it's frustrating for people. And I understand all of that. It's tiring and frustrating for elected officials, too, at times. So uh, the enforcement um, is happening, but it's like anything. I mean, there are people who will drive a little faster on the Trans-Canada Highway, and there's not always a police officer there to uh, to enforce that because it can't be everywhere. Based on what you've uh, been briefed on from public health officials, is there any sense as to what the level of uh, immunization needs to be at before we can start talking about relaxing measures? You know, I think that there's, there's sort of a reluctance, Tom, and uh, to be that specific in terms of, you know, the individual targets because they put out targets uh, before and then the Delta variant came along and it changed those targets and that's that's how this is evolving and that's how I guess uh, science evolves uh, as different things happen um, but that causes frustration for people because they hear different targets and then they change and they wonder what's happened so um, their goal I know is just to get as many people as who are willing to get vaccinated vaccinated there's going to be more information coming in in um, uh, next week in terms of some of the strategies around that. I think they have some new strategies in terms of, you know, trying to increase accessibility for those who want to get vaccinated, but maybe there's been just accessibility issues uh, towards it. So I think there's more strategies on that, but I think they're uh, a little reluctant to sort of put out a lot more targets at this point. In Manitoba, Manitobans assume that the current measures that are in place, including with respect to vaccination, proof of vaccination, will remain in place until such time kids under 12 become eligible for vaccination and, and the majority of them are vaccinated? Yeah, d difficult for me to predict. I mean, it's probably a better question for some of the health officials, probably difficult for them to predict too, because part of that is, you know, it's hard to know exactly when uh, that vaccination will be available for those five to 12 here, different things. Uh, you know, in the United States are talking about that potentially being available within a month. Um, our health officials, I think at one point, were hopeful that it would be available uh, next month, and that seems to be less likely, more likely that it might be early next year. So they might be reluctant to sort of make those sort of predictions and, and on the public health orders. I know at this point it's good, I think, as much as possible to have sort of a steady state uh, where the orders aren't sort of changing day by day. I know that, that that's been difficult. I think that's one of the the benefits of having been proactive is then you don't have to make a lot of changes. Some people, and I've heard from them, would would have been critical, you know, a few weeks ago when new orders came in place and said, well, this is, you know, isn't borne out by the epidemiology and I'm not an epidemiologist, but everybody is these days. So there would have been, you know, folks saying that. 
Um, but I think one of the benefits of that is it allows us to be in a more of a steady state for a longer period of time. And, and that itself is beneficial for a lot of people. And those constant changing of orders I know is difficult on businesses and people generally. So uh, to the extent that you know things came in a bit earlier, not only is it beneficial for blunting the fourth wave, but I think a steady state, as long as that can be held, is beneficial for people. A little question period only lasts for two weeks. Boy, question period feels that I could last like two weeks every time I go into it. Um, that would be my, yeah, that would be my expectation. So there'd be a question period on that first Friday. There normally wouldn't be. Um, so we come back on the Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then there'd be question period for the days that we sit the uh, the following week. I know that uh, Manitobans cling to question period. It's like, you know, watching the bombers or the jets. It's that exciting. But, uh, but it's important. The, the, the democratic part of question period while it doesn't always look that way for, for folks, it's important. So we'll have question periods on every day that, uh, that we're sitting. Mm -hmm. okay. and just why, why DC for the COP meeting uh, to chair it? Is it? Was it their turn next? Or? Yeah, I believe, I believe it was their turn. And also, um, I mean, they're not sort of facing an election in an imminent way and that sort of thing. And so it, it, seemed, uh, it seemed logical. Uh, and again, I want to thank uh, Premier Horgan. It was very you know, gracious of him to sort of take this on. I think he's now actually uh, the longest serving Premier in, in Canada, so it might make sense from that regard. And he's only been elected for five years, I think, so maybe that shows uh, I'm only going to be here for two months, so uh, you know, he's a lot longer. But um, it, it, I think it made sense both from where they were in the, in the turn cycle of COF, but also uh, being the uh, senior Premier in, uh, in Canada. Thanks again, everybody.